while we teaching about chronic hepatitis so the so when we look at liver diseases we divide in them into two categories first category is acute hepatitis and other is a chronic hepatitis so but today we'll be discussing this chronic hepatitis what is the, how you define chronic hepatitis what is epidemiology the virology of chronic hepatitis the natural history of the chronic hepatitis what are the clinical features how you diagnose this patient and how you treat and can you prevent them now when we look at liver disease there are two type of liver disease one is acute other the chronic liver disease what do you mean by acute liver disease acute liver disease are those diseases which are self limiting it means that once the injury goes away they heal and here the injury of the liver is not persistent and it is self limiting in the nature whereas we define chronic hepatitis when the injury to liver tissue keeps on recurring that it can occur intermittently or it may be continuous after the injury so the time limit which has been defined to differentiate between these two types of hepatitis is 6 months that means that suppose a liver injury which is going off for a period of more than 6 months it will label as a chronic hepatitis so the two important feature which we see in the liver as a consequence of injury are inflammation in the liver tissue and injury to hepatocytes now when we define acute versus chronic although we take time limit as 6 months but however some of the chronic liver disease can have acute presentation also so at the onset it may be very difficult to differentiate whether it's acute or chronic liver disease to begin with and you need to be followed and one needs to follow the patient over a period of time differentiate whether it's actually chronic or acute liver disease for example a young female can come with acute hepatitis like illness she may be having underlying chronic hepatitis which is called autoimmune related so at the onset you may not be able to differentiate and only when you follow up this patient or you do some other test you may be able to differentiate yes this patient has a chronic hepatitis but for simple learning purpose we can simply remind that acute hepatitis is something which is self limiting a chronic is a condition in which there is a persistent relapsing injury is occurring over a period of 6 months now how do you define this chronic hepatitis the first thing is that we look at the clinical feature of liver disease somebody who is having jaundice for a more than 6 months which will be chronic or intermittent or he is having persistent fatigue or persistent malaise for 6 months he may be having chronic hepatitis similarly we look at the liver function test and here we look at the liver function liver enzymes that is ast ALT and alfos and if this enzymes are elevated over a period of 6 months person may be having a chronic liver disease or a chronic hepatitis so the important thing here to understand is that this enzyme elevation may be intermittent that it that is suppose you do lft now it will normal but you if you repeat that that may be elevated so a single value is not of much of the use you have to do serial liver function test and you have to follow up whether actually enzymes are being elevated or not Similarly, we look at the certain markers, which we call serological markers. For example, for hepatitis B, we look at the antigen. Similarly, for hepatitis C, we look for the antibodies, and we also look for the SV RNA. So, what are the etiologies of chronic hepatitis? The first important etiology is viral hepatitis. Now, we all know there are two type of viral hepatitis. One are acute, other are chronic. The acute one we all know hepatitis E and A. The chronic one are hepatitis B virus, C, and hepatitis G virus. The other etiologies are immune-mediated liver, liver injury, which we call as a autoimmune hepatitis. The other is a <coughs> metabolic disorder, Wilson's. in which there is excess copper storage in the liver other is a hemochromatosis in which excess storage of iron occurs in the liver and another important thing nowadays is non alcoholic fatty liver fatty liver disease which is nothing but a part of metabolic syndrome where there is a deposition of excess fat in the liver the alcohol is also important etiology of chronic liver disease nowadays the chronic hepatitis because of the alcohol is rising this is because of changing the lifestyle but in today's talk we will discuss about the viral and autoimmune liver disease uh as already i have outlined how do you diagnose chronic hepatitis b 
it is being simply diagnosed on the presence of a surface antigen in the blood. If the antigen is diagnosed over a period of more than six months, a person may be having chronic hepatitis B. Similarly, for SCVR, which persists for a period of more than six months, he may be having chronic hepatitis. Now, the important thing here is to understand somebody who comes for the first time with surface antigen, whether he has got a chronic hepatitis B or not. Now, here is important thing is that you look at the history. Somebody who has got a recent blood transfusion, a surgery, or other high risk behavior, he may be having acute hepatitis. Other person who is maybe detected surface antigen incidentally. Now, this person the question arises whether he has got acute or chronic hepatitis. Now, keeping you have to look for this in the epidemiology of a disease. Now, country like India, where the prevalence of HPV is 2 to 4 percent. Most likely, at any person who is coming with the first report of HPCG, likely to have a chronic hepatitis B. Similarly, for hep C RNA, we have again look for the risk factor. The single most important factor for HCV RNA is blood transfusion and uh, any stromulistic injury or taking penile injections in the last three to six months. If they are not there, the most likely person is having chronic well, hepatitis because of C-related virus. Now, if we look at the epidemiology of the HPV virus, the hepatitis B virus, when you look carefully at the map of this world, it is prevalent throughout the world. But however, the prevalence of this virus is not uniform. There are certain areas where this disease is highly prevalent. What are these areas? These are the Africa, Brazil, South East Asia, China, and Canada and the Greenland. Here, the prevalence of HV virus is more than 8%. Now, when we look at the India, the prevalence of the HV virus is anywhere from 3 to 4%. So, India is labeled as an intermediate area for the hepatitis B prevalence. Now, at present, this prevalence in India is not falling down, it is remaining constant. However, certain countries of the world, like Taiwan or parts of China, Hong Kong, they have cut down their prevalence dramatically. The single most important factor which has made this difference is the vaccination, HPV and the virus. And they have cut down their prevalence, which was way beyond 8% to less than 0.9%. And India, in fact, has also started universal vaccination of HPV, which is gradually picking up. Now, maybe another like five to 10 years, you may see a low, low prevalence rate. Now, the important thing I want to highlight to all of you is that this is a disease which you can say people a vaccination. All of you must take this vaccine and also ensure your new relatives, your friends, or children, your family get tested. And if they're negative, they should also get vaccinated. A simple vaccine which is available, a very cost effective, cheap vaccine is available, and it can simply prevent it. So, the most important thing is that you can prevent this disease by a vaccine which is available, and one must ensure vaccinate as many as possible individuals who are eligible to take this vaccine. Now, when, now the hepatitis B virus is divided into the genotypes. Now, what is the importance of this genotype? Is that there are eight genotypes of this virus. Certain genotypes of this virus are associated with a response to interferon, which is being used for the treatment or progression to cirrhosis or a risk of parasitic carcinoma. Now, when we look at the response to interferon, the genotype A and B have very good response to interferon. In fact, their drug of choice in this genotype is interferon. Similarly, when we look at the risk of progression to cirrhosis, genotype D and A have but less high risk of progression. Similarly, risk of which is higher in genotype C as compared to B. In India, two most important genotypes are under A and D, and they're almost equally distributed. Normally, we don't do the genotype of the virus in our routine work of hepatitis B virus. Only when we're planning for interferon therapy, we we'll do genotyping. This is because genotype D is equally prevalent to genotype A and its response to interferon is extremely low. So if we are contemplating interferon therapy, we would like to have a genotype. Now, if you look at the hepatitis C, again, like HPV is distributed throughout the world. Similarly, prevalence of C is not uniform throughout the world. There are certain areas of the world like Russia, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, 
which is the prevalence of hep C is very high. However, the prevalence of the India is some between intermediate and as per the data which is available for the blood bank, the prevalence of hep C varies around 0.8%. And it is estimated almost 12 to 18 million of hepatitis C virus infections are there in India. Now again, like hepatitis B, we divide hepatitis C virus into three, uh, six genotypes. And in India, the most important genotype is genotype 3. Also, we see genotype 1, which is very less. Now, why it is important to know what genotypes is that, for example, if you look at genotype 3, it is associated with insulin resistance. As a person with genotype 3 can develop fatty liver, it can develop diabetes. Previously, the drug which was used to treat was interferon. In that, the response to one genotype 1 was very poor, with interferon, only 10% patient is cure. But nowadays, we have got oral drugs, which we know as popular DEA, which is a drug directly acting anti agents. And they are equally effective along the genotypes. And also, duration of treatment was influenced by genotypes previously. However, the another important thing is nowadays the risk of cancer. The risk of cancer is much higher than genotype 3 as compared to genotype 1. So, knowing the genotype will help to stratify the risk of progression of disease in this patient, especially who are coming with a long standing history. Now, uh, it is very important to know about the structure of the virus. This is because this helps us to develop vaccines, therapies, and understand the pathogens of diseases. Now, if we look at the structure of hepatitis B virus, now hepatitis B virus belongs to Hepedna virus PD family. It is a large virus, around 42 nanometer in this size. Now, one of the most peculiar things about this virus is that it has got it is a DNA virus, but the strand of this is partially a double stranded circular. It means that two strands of DNA are there, but second strand of DNA is not a complete strand. And these two strands of DNA, they are not in straight form and they're overlapping with each, uh, each other. The genome of this virus is extremely small. It has got only 3,200 nuclear bases and it has got four open reading frames. The meaning of the open reading frame is places from where the transcription can start and the DNA can be converted to RNA. So there are four places from where this can open hepatitis B virus. Now, when we look at the virus, the outermost is an envelope. This envelope has lipid particle along with surface antigen. Inside that is a core. The core has got a core antigen. And further inside, there is a hepatitis B genome along with the enzyme DNA polymerase. Now, this is a detailed structure of the hepatitis B virus. This is a genome of the hepatitis B virus. This genome, when we look, it has got two strands of DNA. And there are the four open reading frames. Now, because the overlapping structure of the hepatitis B virus DNA, large number of the proteins can be produced despite having a small amount of nucleotides. What happens, like suppose a virus which wants to produce surface antigen, it can produce small surface antigen, a large or a very large, depending upon the place from where the transcription starts. Similarly, for a core region, it can produce a core, pre core, or it can produce pre antigen. And this overlapping structure of DNA virus helps the virus to produce large number of protein despite having small structure. Now here is a something about the structure. The innermost structure is nucleocapsid core, which has got a core protein, which we call as a core antigen. Now what is the importance of the core antigen? Now the core antigen is, is so depending on the length, it produces two, two types of the antigen. The first is a hepatitis B E antigen. Now, the importance of this antigen is that it is thought to induce intolerance. Now, how does it produce intolerance? This antigen is extremely small. When this antigen is present in the mother, it can cross the placenta, enter the fetus, and as we all know, 
the immune system refeed is not very matured. So it recognizes this antigen something as a own and it doesn't produce an immune response. The child gets transmission of this infection during the process of the birth. Thus, the child who is newborn will have a chronic hepatitis because it will not be surmounting immune response to this antigen later on in the life. Similarly, this E antigen is a marker of replication. High, if you detect this antigen in the blood, the chances are that your T level in the blood will be higher. Now, the core antigen normally cannot be detected in the blood because of large particle. The main function of core antigen is that it helps to assemble the virus. Now, in these regions, certain mutations can occur and mutant strain of the hepatitis B virus can be produced. There are two types of mutant virus, one the pre-core and the basal core mutants, depending upon whether the E antigen is produced or not. If no amount of E antigen is produced, we call it the pre-core mutant virus. And if among some amount of E antigen is produced, we call it a basal core mutant. So the importance of mutant is that this mutant strain of the virus, they can cause a type of hepatitis, which we call as chronic hepatitis B. E negative. Now, if this type of hepatitis generally occurs in the later part of life, and as per some studies, this type of hepatitis is thought to be more severe, high chance of cancer, which, which is associated with some of the studies. Now, the outermost part we call as envelope glycoprotein, which is a surface antigen. Which the importance of this antigen is that it is the most common method by which you diagnose the hepatitis B virus. This is because hepatitis B virus produces large amount of this antigen in the blood. And it can be easily diagnosed by a simple ELISA test, which is a very cheap and effective method to diagnose this virus. And antibodies against this antigen help to neutralize the virus because when antibody bind to this uh, surface uh, antigen, the virus is not able to enter the hepatocytes. The next important thing in the hepatitis B virus is the enzyme DNA polymerase, which is which is a unique type of DNA polymerase is that. It also has got a reverse transcript activity, transcriptive activity. It means that normally a DNA virus will produce another DNA strand and it replicates. However, HPV uses a unique strategy of replication. It, uh, it replicates something like a hepatitis HIV virus, where from first a DNA strand, it produces another RNA strand and this RNA is converted into DNA. So this, occur, this occurs because the hepatitis B virus DNA polymerase enzyme has got both activities. It can produce a DNA from a DNA and it can also produce a RNA from a DNA. That is, it has got a reverse transcript activity. This is a unique feature and this is used as a target for the drugs. The drugs which are acting against reverse transcriptase are being used for management of the hepatitis B virus. The largest of the all protein is HPV protein. Function of this protein is largely unknown, but is thought to help in replication of virus. It is associated with development of tumor and is thought to get integrated in the genome of the host where it activates a number of genomes which can cause the cancer in them. Now, how does the HPV replicate inside the hepatocytes? Now, the HPV only replicates in the hepatocytes. The first thing is that virus has to enter the host cells. Now, this entry is mediated by specific receptors. The receptors are largely unknown at present, but they are thought to be a uh, sodium tauroprolate receptor by which hepatitis B virus binds and it enters the hepatocytes. Once it enters, the outermost envelope region is lost, only the core region remains, and this core region subsequently gets dissolved, and the genome of the hepatitis B virus, that is DNA, it enters the hepatocytes. Now, once it enters the hepatocytes, it undergoes the process of repair because it is partially double stranded DNA, so it produces the host machinery and it forms a double stranded DNA strand. And it forms a unique type of DNA inside the hepatocytes, which we also call as mini chromosome for HV virus. It becomes something like a hairpin structure. And this hairpin structure is extremely stable in the nature and is commonly called as covalent circular DNA. And once this DCC DNA is formed, it remains in the hepatocyte throughout the life. It means that once you got HIV infection, the virus is going to stay inside the liver throughout your life, and you will have risk of developing infection at any given point of time. This is uh, at present we don't have any drugs available which can act and destroy the CCDNA. Thus, whatever treatment as of now is available is 
is can this control your disease another thing is that normally cc dna the only way it can be destroyed is by attacking the hepatocytes that is you have to damage your own cells so once the cc dna is formed inside the hepatocytes either it can form the rna which may be used to produce the another strand of dna or it can be used for the production of viral proteins and subsequently the full structure virus is produced and released in the outside hepatocytes some amount of the virus cycle back and come inside the hepatocyte nucleus again and forms the cc dna so when we look at the structure of scv hepatitis b hepatitis c virus is large as compared to hpv it is around 40 nanometer in the size and it has got a large genome and this genome is a single stranded rna virus and it has got almost 9600 base pairs in it uh the at the end of the region 5 and 3 which we call as conserved regions and this means that mutation in this region of the hepatitis b virus it doesn't occur the 5 dash region role is that it help the hc virus to enter endoplasmic reticulum and the role of 3 dash region is that to stabilize the structure of the virus now if you look at the hepatitis c virus structure as i told it is a single stranded rna virus which means there is a single strand of this virus and this virus has got a single open reading frame it means that the virus genome can be read from one place and a single rna can only produce from this virus so it means when the virus is replicating or producing its own rna it will produce a single large strand of the rna which will be used to produce a single large protein of hepatitis c virus so this protein subsequently gets split to form the multiple other proteins which are have, having different function for hepatitis c virus and in order to split it uses the proteins of its own as its host proteases and it produces a protein which you called as core protein envelope proteins and the non structural proteins the proteins in the core of the capsid are stable proteins which are envelope region they undergo very large amount of mutations that's why this region is called as hyper variable region the region of ns uh, non structural ns2 and ns3 and ns4 are collectively called as protease and helicase region because this region produces enzyme protease and helicase the function of the protease enzyme from hepatitis c virus is that it splits the single polyprotein into multiple uh, multiple proteins needed for virus replication and function of the helicase is that it unwinds the cv rna and help to translate it the largest region of this virus is ns5 region which is which produces a protein which is a rna dependent rna polymerase which help to replicate the virus now knowing the structure of the virus has helped to produce the drugs which are acting in this different region the two most important region in this are protease and the rna dependent rna polymerase what we popularly call as directly acting antiviral agents they are acting mainly against polymerase enzyme some of the drugs are acting as protease agent and this has discovery has in fact dramatically changed the management of scv and you all know that the three scientists who have worked on this structure have got have received the nobel prize in the physiology for this okay when we look at the replication of the hepatitis c virus unlike the hepatitis b virus the replication largely occurs in cytoplasm the sc virus like hep b enters the hepatocytes by the binding receptors the receptors are thought to be ldl particle binding sites and once it enter the hepatocyte the virus genome is released and it enter the endoplasmic reticulum where the translation of this cv virus occur and polyprotein is produced which i already told and this polyprotein undergo the process by which different proteins are being produced which help to replicate the virus and produce large amount of the protein and hepatitis c virus rna which get released into the blood circulation now what is the natural history of this virus is now the natural history of hpv if you look at this slide carefully the important thing here to understand is that a person who has got hpv virus whether he will have a life long infection or not that depends upon the age at which you acquire hpv infection 
suppose you acquire this infection early in the life that is some time at the time of the birth or at around 6 month almost 90% of time you will have a persistent virus over the life as your age increases chances of chronicity of hepatitis b also go down this is because of your immune system we all know for the viral disease the single most important thing is your immune system if your immune system is effective is will able to control the viral diseases as of we all know in early childhood or neonates the immune system is not fully developed hence they are not able to curtail this infection and the virus persists throughout the life so if we have to target a population ideally you should immunize neonates or early in the child now this now uh, this slide is about the phases of the hepatitis b infection once chronic hepatitis b is established we divide the phase of the infection now although this phase of infection i has shown over the period of the age sometime they can overlap and they can occur at different time of point of time also now the first phase of infection is which we all know is hpv positive chronic hiv infection what does it mean it means that virus enter the liver and immune system is not developed so what happens that virus replicate large amount of dna is produced in the virus large amount of hbs antigen is produced now if you do the liver function test enzyme will not be raised because the immune system is not developed now as the virus <coughs> as the time passes on the immune system matures it start targeting the hepatocytes where this virus replicating what happens is that as the immune system start targeting the hepatocytes the liver cell start getting damaged and the enzyme from the liver started getting released so your liver enzyme will start rising now since your immune system is targeting the virus the replication of the virus will go down so the immune level will start coming down and also the s antigen titers so over a period of time the immune system will be able to control the virus and now you will have a disease in which your enzymes will come down because the virus is not replicating anymore and your t level will be low so this we call as hv negative chronic hv infection now in some of the individual as we already discussed the mutations can occur in the virus for example pre core mutant or basal core promoter mutants can occur and this mutant strain of the virus is they are able to evade the host immune system and virus start replicating again but however this mutant virus is not as effective as a wild type of strain of virus that's why that's why the dna level doesn't go as high as previously and similarly the level of the enzymes also fluctuate because virus is replicating intermittently so in diagnosis phase one has to do a repeated liver function test and also dna titers so this is a recent uh, update about this infection phases this phases have been divided into uh, five categories as per the recent uh, classification the first is hpv positive and second is hpv negative so for, for first phase is a chronic hiv infection it means you have a disease what will be further the features you will have a very high tetracycline antigen your e antigen will be positive dna will be very very high but your liver enzyme will be normal and if you do a liver biopsy you will not find any inflammation or or very minimal evidence of liver injury this phase was previously called as a immune tolerant phase then the next phase is that when your immune system start activating that get activated so again in this phase what happens is that your level of serotonin will be slightly lower and it will be positive dna level will not be as high as in the tolerant phase but liver enzyme will be elevated because the hepatocytes are getting injured and similarly will find the evidence of a disease in the biopsy you can have a variable amount of liver injury this phase was previously called as immune reactive which we positive phase the third phase is a chronic hiv infection Indeed, this is the phase in which virus get weakened and DNA level will be less than the normal and E antigen will negative. Previously, this was called as inactive carrier phase. Now, the next phase is a chronic hepatitis B, E antigen negative disease. This is a phase during which mutant virus arises. So, 
protein level will be high but not as high as uh, other two phases. RAM will be elevated, which get intermediate elevation, and you will have evidence of liver injury. The last phase is called edge infection. This phase is extremely uncommon in this virus, and this uh, one can say it occur in less than one more or less 0.2% of PDSB virus patients, where the surface and they also become negative. In the level, you become extremely low, and your ALT levels are also normal. Now, what is natural history of HV virus? So, the natural history of HV virus is that once the virus enters your body, you will have an acute HV virus, acute hepatitis. The majority of the individual of having this type of acute hepatitis are asymptomatic. Only 5% of patients of severe asymptomatic and they will have some jaundice, fatigue, or malaise. But unfortunate part is that the majority of the individual will land up in the chronic hepatitis virus infection. This is because the immune system is not very much effective to control this virus. Now, what is that thing which can control? The studies have shown that the interferon lambda plays a key role in control of hepatitis C virus infection. Now, the gene which involved in interferon lambda expression is IL-28 gene and the individual which are producing large amount is interferon lambda and they are able to clear the virus which can occur in around 20 to 25 percent of the patient and the individual who are in favorable genotype of IL-28 gene they will be able to control the virus and have the clear the virus the rest of the people will land up in chronic SCV infection now some individual of chronic SCV will further progress to cirrhosis which Occur, occur over 10 to 20 years. People like H, who has got HIV, who consume alcohol, or who have other drugs which can cause liver injury or uh, contract edge infection, the risk may be higher. Around 5 to 10 percent of the patient of chronic hepatitis C they may land up in cirrhosis. Once cirrhosis occurs, a further progression can occur in form of decompensation. These people can develop tumor and ultimately unstable liver is early death. So why the chronic viral hepatitis very is important? People label it silent killer. Why? This is because majority of the patient of chronic viral hepatitis are asymptomatic. That is, they don't have any symptoms or symptoms are non-specific like fever, myalgia, fatigue, some degree of weakness. So until as you do tests like surface antigen, anti-HCV, you will not be able to diagnose them. Similarly, cirrhosis. <clears throat> for example, we look at cirrhosis of liver. We divide into phases, compensated and decompensated phases. The compensated phase is very long in this patient, and majority of patients again are asymptomatic. And once decompensation occurs, the survival becomes very poor until you treat them or you do a liver transplant. And this virus is also called fatal carcinoma. And sometimes the patients can die in love SCC. This is very common with HV virus, where the person will be coming to be with a large tumor. He may be totally asymptomatic. But he will come to you with the arch tumor in the liver. And here, if you do surface antigen testing, he will be antigen positive. And this can occur even without a cirrhosis. So, we, you have to very high index of suspicion to diagnose this type of patient. And ideally, if, ideally if there are risk factors like blood transfusion, a surgery, a family history of HBV, one can do the screening test. And screening test like simple, cheap surface antigen or doing antibody for hep C virus available. Now once cirrhosis occurs, we all know what are the common symptoms. The person can have ascites, they may be prominent features, veins around the umbilicus, males can have testicular atrophy, you can have large spleen, they can come with varicial bleed, they may have muscle mass loss, they can come with altered sensorium resulting in hepatic and Now these viruses can also cause extra hepatic symptoms. They may be arthralgias, arthritis, polyatron nodosa, they can have renal involvement, they can come with not phenomena, skin involvement from the chin planus, autoimmune disorders, or they can come with increase of malignancy that has also been reported as Hepsi virus. So this virus does not only cause liver disease, they can sometimes come with extra hepatic uh, symptoms also. So how, how do you diagnose? the the tests which are being done can be divided into two parts. The first is a biochemical investigation. The biochemical investigation are helpful to look for the certain complications. For example, a simple blood count, we look for the platelet count. If a platelet count is less than 1.5 lakh, 
we will look carefully for cirrhosis. In liver function test, we will look for liver enzyme whether elevated or not. We look for albumin. No albumin again will point to, towards the underlying chronic liver disease. People of hepatitis C virus can develop diabetes. They can have lipid, lipid profile also. Now, the most important thing when a person comes with chronic viral hepatitis is that there is a long latent period of this disease during which patient is asymptomatic and one doesn't know when the patient has got the virus. So one needs to assess how much liver has been damaged. Now there are two components. One is how much amount of fibrosis has occurred and how much inflammation is there. Now the most important thing here to understand is that to assess the fibrosis, we are nowadays we have got non-invasive tests available in the form of the biomarkers in the blood or tests which are based on the elastography. Normally a liver is a very compliant type of tissue. So it's very elastic, but in cirrhosis, because of fibrosis, the liver becomes stiff. So, and this stiffness can be measured by the help of radiography test. Uh, common use are crown elastography, MR elastography, or after test. So a stiff liver will give you high value of this test. Now one can also do simple imaging like ultrasound, look for the complications. We look for tumor, we look for the feature code hypertension, and one can do also endoscopy looking for code hypertension. So how do you evaluate a person who's come with chronic hepatitis B? We do surface antigen, we do E antigen, and we do a DNA test. And for liver disease, we look at the liver enzymes. We do fibrosis marker in the form of non-invasive fiber markers. At present, elastography is a test of choice. Biopsy nowadays is not done in the majority of the cases. Only in very selected cases, a liver biopsy is needed. Now, for the hep C, the first test is a, doing an antibody test and subsequently confirmation. Now, antibody is done by the ELISA. Somebody who has got an antibody, it means a person has got a chronic hep C. The virus, as we already have known, studies that 25% of the patient may be able to create the virus. So whether they have got active viral disease or not, you have to look for the RNA. So normally we do a real-time polymer chain reaction. Recently, uh, antigen testing has also been available. The advantage is that it is much cheaper as compared to the PCR testing and can be done easily. But however, it's not still not being widely available. Previously, genotype was very important because interferon was drug of choice. But as now new drugs are being available, genotype testing is optional in this what type in these treatment patients. Now, how do you evaluate a person with chronic STV? Now, this is the slide in which we uh, look for the antibodies and as well as for the RNA levels. So, a person who has got positive antibody, the nowadays RIVA is not being done, we simply do STV RNA, and if STV RNA is present, we label as a person having STV infection. Suppose his RNA is negative, we will be just following up these patients. Now, how do you treat the HV patients? Now, this slide is a very, uh, in this slide, what I just want to highlight is that, when we want to treat HV virus, the two most important things. The first thing is that one has to tell patient this is a long-term treatment. Treatment may in fact last for lifelong. Second thing is that whether to treat or not, that depends upon how much liver damage is there, whether there is inflammation in the liver or not. So, so in order to look for, suppose somebody has got a cirrhosis, he will need a treatment. Somebody has got decomposed cirrhosis, he will need a treatment. Person of chronic hepatitis B, who has evidence of liver injury, that is ALT is more than two times, DNA more than five logs, or fibrosis on the biopsy, or non visible treatment, or inflammation in the biopsy, these are the persons who need a therapy. So how do you treat patient with HIV viruses? We have got two types of therapy, one is interferon, other are nucleoside and nucleoside and lobes. Now the interferon's advantage is that you, have, you can treat them with finite duration of treatment, and once you stop treatment, it can last for some time. And chances of loss of cell cell antigen are higher with this type of therapy. But the main problem is that it has got a lot of side effects. And as on, already we have discussed in the physiology, the hepatitis D uh, in HPV, the D type of genotype is quite prevalent in India, and here the response to interferon is not good. And interferons cannot also be used in patients who are having cirrhosis or who have a lot of com comorbidities. The main advantage of nucleoside alone is that they can be Use without any side effects. The patients, the patients are uh, are very readily accepting them, and this type of drugs are potent drugs that 
they have got a rapid onset of action. But the main problem with these drugs is that once you start therapy with them, it's a very long term of treatment. And some of drugs like Tenofovir can cause any problems. And the cost is the main hindrance when you are treating this patient with drugs. Another problem is drug resistance can develop, but chances of resistance with new drugs are extremely less. So in this, uh, the drugs which we commonly use are uh, Antigavir, which is a Gunosanalo, Tenofovir, and Tenofovir alphanamide. Tenofovir alphamide is a new drug which is available. As compared to previous uh, progenitor, Tenofovir is a proactive drug and less amount of doses is needed. And it has shown to cause less side effects in the form of yield dysfunction. So the three important drugs which are being available in this category are Tenofovir, Antigavir, and Tenofovir alphanamide. Any of this drug can be used as per requirement. But normally for the female, uh, Tenofovir is preferred because Tenofovir is drug which is saved during the pregnancy. And large amount of data is available from the HIV studies. Now for the STV, the treatment has evolved over a period of time. The first drugs which we called as directly agents for protease inhibitors. But the problem with this protease inhibitor was that these drugs were developing rapid resistance. Now with the advent of NS5A inhibitors and polymers inhibitors, this has been largely been overcome and these drugs are very effective and they have got very high potency and they have got a very high barrier resistance, especially to the polymerase inhibitors. Because the NS5A region, the polymerase region, if the mutation organs the virus will not be able to replicate. So the mutation in this region, two drugs are very less. And the most important drug which is available against this region is the sofosobvir. And NS5 inhibitors are ledipathovir, uh, daclatazovir, and velpatazovir. This is a simple slide. Uh, so how do you treat the patient? Now, the, the most common type of genotype is at present genotype 3 in India. Here, we give it 12 weeks of therapy for persons not having cirrhosis, a 20 weeks therapy for the person who are having cirrhosis. Now, something about the prevention. Now, the, in chronic viral hepatitis, to my mind, the most important thing is to prevent the HV and STV. Now, how you can prevent HPV? We have already discussed, uh, already discussed vaccine. A simple vaccine is available, which can be given very easily and has got a very good response. So, the first and foremost strategy to prevent HPV is infection. Unfortunately, the same thing has not happened with HPV virus. The vaccine largely have been ineffective. This is because this virus developed very fast mutations. And envelope region antibodies are largely non utilizing the nature. So in this, for STV, what strategy has worked is that provision of safe blood products. The blood banking, which has improved in developing countries, has helped to curtail the infection. Now, previously in the blood banks, uh, for screening purpose, simple ELEGA test for antibodies was done. But nowadays, all of the blood banks are doing STV RNA also. So that has helped, also had to control the STV infection. And the second most important thing is that to prevent the unsafe injections. This is a, one of the most important factors for transmission of infection of HPV. HPV and HCV in the developing countries. And WHO and other countries are largely, WHO and other health agencies are largely promoting these safe injection practices. Nowadays, single time injection needles have been available, which just break once used them. So, the most important thing in viral hepatitis is to prevent prevent viral hepatitis. This is the only way where you can prevent the long-term morbid mortality and is the single most effective strategy, especially for developing countries. So I just want to highlight one thing is that please take HIV vaccine if you have not taken motivated relatives, family, friends to take HIV vaccine. The vaccines are being available are two types. One is a recombinant vaccine, other is a angiotex, uh, which is properly available. Any one of these vaccines can be taken. Now, the second uh, important uh, chronic hepatitis is autoimmune hepatitis. The terminology is, is self explanatory, it means the immune rate in the liver. Now, if you look at autoimmune hepatitis, it occurs throughout the world and it can be seen in any age group. But by and large, this disease has got two peaks. One is around puberty 
and subsequently fourth and sixth decade of life. So majority of the cases are in adolescent or the elderly age groups. Now, how does the autoimmune hepatitis present? Patient may be asymptomatic. It means that when you do liver and then test, you will find this AST, ALT. And once you evaluate them, you will be finding them having autoimmune liver disease. They can come with acute hepatitis, that is short duration of history, four weeks of jaundice, or they can come with a severe disease. That means they can come with jaundice, ascites, and encephalopathy. But the most common type of presentation in clinical practice is insidious onset, where the patient will come with history of fatigue, lethargy, intermittent jaundice, arthralgia for three to six months. Now, the acute type of uh, autoimmune hepatitis occur in 25% of the patient. And here, if you look at true acute autoimmune hepatitis, it means that if you do liver biopsy, you will not find any fibrosis. This is extremely rare. And here, the autoantibodies can be absent. The most important thing which one has to keep, keep in the mind, even when the patient is coming with a history of like three to six months, if you do a biopsy, you will find one third of this patient left cirrhosis. Why? This is because the initial part of disease patients are asymptomatic and they have a long asymptomatic course during which mild liver injury was going on, going on, and it has got the cirrhosis already there. Now, how do you classify? The classification of autoimmune hepatitis into three types is there. Type 1, 2, and type 3. Type 1 is the most common type. 90% of the cases are because of type 1. And classically here, the anti antibody or anti smooth muscle antigen or anti-soluble liver antigen or liver pancreas is present. It is largely associated with HLA, DR3, DR4, and DR13. And it may occur at any age, but usually seen in the puberty age group. Severity of disease is variable. The most important feature is that it has got a very good treatment response. Uh, type 2 autoimmune hepatitis just contribute to 10% of the cases. It is associated with the antibody which we see in type 2 are anti-liver kidney microsome 1, anti-liver soluble antigen, and really anti-LKM3. It is associated generally with HLA DR3 and DR7. Autoimmune hepatitis 2 generally seen in childhood or young adulthood, and most commonly. The disease is advanced or it has got acute presentation unlike type 1. And another problem with type 2 is that there are frequent relapses once you stop this drug. So you have to give a life, lifelong immunosuppression. Type 3 is a very rare and a majority of these patients will be negative to conventional antibodies. And to diagnose type 3, we need to do the anti soluble liver antigen or liver pancreas antibody. And sometimes they may have anti RO5 antibody also. And again, they are uh, they need a lifelong treatment with the immunosuppressive agents. Now, how does the injury occur in autoimmune hepatitis? Uh, this slide is showing this. Now, this is an antigen presenting cell, which is usually all is macrophages in the liver. Now, this antigen presenting cell uh, take up the hepatocytes antigen and present to the T uh, uh, T uh, helper cells which subsequently can differentiate into Th1 and Th2. Th1 injures the hepatocyte by uh, gamma interferon pathways by activating the T lymphocytes or by activating the macrophages. The Th2 response results in the production of uh, cytokine, which activates the B lymphocytes, which differentiate to plasma cell and produce antibodies. These antibodies are helpful in diagnosis of Infection or these antibodies are also attack the hepatocytes. Now, how do you diagnose autoimmune hepatitis? So, first of all, is that a person will be coming to history of intermittent jaundice or raised liver enzyme, or he may be coming with history of cirrhosis. Now, first, uh, the most common type of autoimmune hepatitis or uh, chronic hepatitis, viral hepatitis. Once this, these are ruled out, we will we we'll look for autoimmune hepatitis. The first thing which we do is normally the auto auto antibodies. Normally we do ANA, asthma, and LKM. Now, if these antibodies are negative and we think there's a very high chance, we do other anti auto antibodies. And if these antibodies are pre uh, present, liver biopsy is normally required to confirm the diagnosis. If these antibody tests are negative and where suspicion of diagnosis is very, very high, uh, one can repeat this antibody testing in specialty labs, which are available in Dashi care centers. And one can do non functional antibodies, and if they're positive, we consider it as an autoimmune hepatitis. 
Now, what is the histopathology of autoimmune hepatitis? The classically three modern features which are being seen are interface hepatitis, enteral policies, and rosetting. The interface hepatitis means what? Normally, in the portal tract, the blood vessels are present. So, the lymphocytes are present in the blood vessel. We all know. So, this lymphocyte will be migrating from the hair to the liver cells. Now, the nearby most uh, uh, cells which are to the portal tract are uh, liver cells which are close to portal tract. So, injury of this will cause interface hepatitis. Ampullosis means the lymphocytes will be seen in damaged hepatocytes. These are the classical feature of autoimmune hepatitis. Now, in order to facilitate diagnosis of <coughs> autoimmune hepatitis, a scoring system has been developed which has been changed over a period of time. And nowadays, a simple scoring system is being used. So, this is based on four features. You look for autoantibodies, you look for IgG levels, you look for liver histology and absence of viral hepatitis and on the base of this, you use scoring. So, we will have to look for the type of the antibody and depending upon that, scoring is being, being given and how much risk in global levels are there and or liver biopsy, one look whether it's compatible with the autoimmune hepatitis or typical or atypical. And we label if score is more than seven is definitive autoimmune hepatitis and probable in the score is more than equal to 6. Now, how do you treat autoimmune hepatitis? So, the management of autoimmune hepatitis again depend upon the severity of disease. Somebody has got advanced fibrosis in the liver, he will require treatment. People who have got evidence of liver injury in biopsy, that is biopsy showing more than 4 score in uh, on the liver biopsy, again treatment is indicated. For people who have got mild disease, it means the liver enzymes are not raised more than three times and minimal inflammation. This type of patient management depends upon whether he is elderly, what is the age and whether the patient wants to get treatment or not. Suppose a person is elderly, he has got diabetes, hypertension. So, in this you may not treat them because treatment has a lot of side effects. On the other hand, if somebody who is a young individual, you cannot follow up them, then you may treat in this. Then you may uh, treat. So, how do you uh, treat? Uh, treatment is being divided into two phases. One is induction and maintenance therapy. So, for the induction, we use steroids, and the steroid of choice here is a prednisolone. So, you give one milligram per kg body weight. Normally, we give maximum 40 kg of steroids, and we assess the response. The response is assessed by looking at liver enzymes, AST, ALT, and bilirubin phased. And <laughs> in these enzymes, are coming down, we add other thioprene and we gradually increase the dose of the thioprene and start taking the steroids. The people in whom the response doesn't occur, the most important factor is non-compliance. If person is compliant, one can give IV steroids or one can use other therapies. So by and large, the management of the autoimmune hepatitis is steroids along with other thioprene in long term. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the class is over for today.
Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, 